Okay, so we are finishing up Romans chapter 5, and we are starting into Romans chapter 6 today, which is so thrilling. Um, I can't even believe we're doing this. I can't, can't even believe we're at this point. So exciting. I do want to tell you all that uh, I have another resource that I haven't talked about in previous videos that I did use in preparation for this class. And that is this book, The Normal Christian Life by Watchman Nee. Um, I am going to recommend this at the end of the course as a resource um, for you to dig deeper in learning some of these truths. I do not agree with everything Watchman Nee believes. I don't agree with everything he says in this book. Um, but by the time we get done with Romans 8, you will be able to know the difference between some of the things that he says and what I'm saying. But what he has to say about <laughs> Romans 6, I love. So <laughs> um, I am going to read to you out of this a little bit too today. Um, just some some things that, that really helped me and helped uh, my understanding. So anyway, some of the illustrations and stuff for today come out of this book. Also, um, the, the normal ones, uh, including Romans verse by verse by William R. Newell. Again, I don't agree with everything he says, but great book. Romans, Deliverance from Wrath by Zane Hodges. Again, I don't agree with everything that he says, but it's really good. And then um, the classes that I took in Bible school on Romans um, by Ernie Richards are also, well, those are like the most used ones. Um, yeah. Okay. So with all that, you know, don't want to plagiarize. Um, <laughs> we'll get, we'll continue on in Romans. So open up to Romans chapter five, if you're not there already. And, uh, we're going to finish this section up. Now we need to remember, of course, that the chapter numbers are not inspired. <laughs> Um, and so what he says in chapter five flows right into chapter six. Um, yeah, there would, you know, probably be like a paragraph break because he brings in a question, but um, the chapter breaks aren't inspired. They're just there to help us navigate in our Bibles um, today, which is nice, okay? That's like, I'm not mad at them, but at the same time, you have to remember um, that this is one flow of thought, this is one letter. So, what we talk about today in Romans chapter 6 is not the whole thing, okay? It's not the whole thing of how God has enabled you to live in holiness. Yay, Katie's here! Or to experience that eternal life that we talked about last week. Now, if you were not here last week, you have to watch the video. <laughs> because I, there's no way I can redo everything that we talked about last week uh, in 15 minute intro or something. I just can't. So you've got to watch the video from last week before next week because it's pertinent to what he says at the end of Romans 6 that you understand what we're talking about, okay, um, in chapter 5. So basically uh, how I would say it is this, that chapter 5 is the foundation for the Christian life. Chapter 6 is the starting point of the Christian life. Chapter 7 explains the wrong way to go about the Christian life. And chapter 8 is the fullness of the Christian life. So understand that what we talk about today, as exciting, amazing, and wonderful it is, as it is, it is not the whole thing. Okay, so you have to keep coming back. Um, you... You have to understand that what he says in Romans 6 is the starting point for all Christian living, but it's not the whole thing. There's more that you need to know, okay, besides what we'll learn today in Romans chapter 6. Um, so, with that introduction, Romans chapter 5 and verse 19. <laughs> okay, Romans chapter 5, verse 19. 
For as by one man's disobedience, <coughs> many were constituted sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be constituted righteous. Okay, now he's tying up everything that he's been saying in Romans chapter 5. Okay, which if you were not with us in, in Romans chapter 5, he is talking about identification. He is starting to explain it. And he kind of lays the, the groundwork and foundation for everything he's going to say in Romans 6, 7, and 8. So in Adam, in our identification with him, he acted as the representative for the human race. And because we are identified with Adam, okay, God identifies us with Adam, we receive the wages, okay, or the benefits, which you can't really call that it that in Adam, but we receive the benefits of what he did as if we did it ourselves. So his sin is counted as my sin, so I receive the same consequences. Okay, so that is one thing that's true about our identification with Adam, is that just as he received the consequence of death, and we talked about that death is, we're not just talking about physical death here, okay, we're talking about separation. In the Bible, death refers to separation. When we talk about physical death, obviously your <coughs> spirit, your soul is being separated from your physical body okay but that's not the devastating thing the devastating thing is spiritual death and in that way adam did die the moment that he ate the fruit he died spiritually in that his spirit was cut off from god he was cut off from the life of god and so he was spiritually dead as a spiritually dead one he became a sinner. He had the nature of a sinner, and all of those who are born in his likeness, in his race, are born with the same sin nature. I like this little phrase <laughs> that my teacher in Bible school used to use. We're all made of the same cookie dough, okay? So that Adamic cookie dough, that Adamic nature, Okay, we are all born with that. And it's not because we sinned personally, but it's because of Adam's sin. So because I'm identified with Adam, because I'm a part of his race, and he is the federal head of my race, and he acted in this one act of disobedience and became a sinner by nature, so I, as a member of Adam's race, was born a sinner by nature. So this is what he means when he says, as by one man's disobedience, many were made or constituted sinners. Okay, so what does that mean, constituted? Constituted means set up to function as, or we could use the, the term hardwired. Okay, we were hardwired sinners. We were set up to function as sinners by the one act of disobedience of Adam. That sounds like terrible news. <laughs> However, what Christ brings in far more than cancels out what Adam's disobedience brought. So, just as by that one act of disobedience, we were constituted or hardwired sinners, by the one act of obedience. And here it says, by one man's obedience. The first Adam disobeyed God and brought in the reign of sin and death. But the second man, as he's called in 1 Corinthians 15, the second head of humanity was perfectly obedient. And his obedience 
culminated in his death. Okay, right in Philippians 2, it says that he became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. The clear teaching of scripture is that Christ died in direct obedience to the will of the Father. Christ died for sin, he died for sinners as an act of obedience to God the Father. And so his obedient act is the thing that can make many to be constituted righteous. So, if constituted means set up to function as, we get some lovely music in the yeah. background. <laughs> okay, so constituted means set up to function as, or hardwired as, righteous. Now we're getting to some good news. Now, we might be a little bit confused then about why we're still sinning. So, we're going to get to that. But... Through his one act, we know this, we have been set up to function as righteous. So he's going to explain that in the coming chapters. Now, he says, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. This says that God gave the law so that <coughs> sin would increase or the offense might abound. Okay, now we don't tend to think that way. <laughs> We tend to think that God brought in the law to reign in sin. No. God brought in the law not only as Romans chapter 3 says, so that we would become conscious of our sin, but also so that our sin would become greater, that it would become magnified, and that we would have more sin. Okay. Very interesting. Okay, now he's going to talk about this more in Romans chapter 7 as to how it relates to believers. But Paul says in Romans chapter 7 that he wouldn't have known sin unless the law had revealed it, such as he wouldn't have known lust unless the law had revealed it. Okay, so obviously everyone has been given light from God, and we talked about how even the Gentiles have um, a work of the law written on their hearts and that they have a conscience. And they know that certain things are wrong, right? But there's many more things that we wouldn't know were wrong without the specific revelation of Scripture or God's law. Um, so, like lust, for instance. There's probably a lot of people in the world who don't really realize that lust is wrong. They just think that the actual act of adultery is wrong. Okay, so when the law says that, their sin increases because they know it's wrong and they sin against it. So we talk about greater light equals greater responsibility, right? So you're held accountable to the light level that you have. And so the more people knew was sin, the more they sinned. Okay, the more people knew was sin, the more they sinned against the light that they had. And so the offense abounded in that way, Okay, that now they're actually breaking commands of God, that they know his righteous requirements, and yet they're not keeping them. The offense also abounded because the law actually enlivens the flesh, which is what we're going to talk about in chapter 7. The law is not a tool for sanctification. The law is not a tool for sanctification. Not, it's not a tool for justification. We already know that. It's also not a tool for sanctification, which is what he's going to talk about more thoroughly in chapter 7. So, the law brings out more sin. And I know we've talked about this before, at least we did last year, that um, Israel was, was given the law verbally before they received the tablets. And 
Did it rain in sin? Were they like acting more holy after they got the law? What happened? After they got the Ten Commandments, what happened? Okay, there, it got way worse, right? So then they build a golden calf, right? They break the first two commandments, okay? And and then they have a, a big orgy, so they break the adultery commandment, right? I, I mean, just rampant sin after the, the giving of the law. So understand that the law does not help you to become righteous. Um, and so God has provided a different way. And if you are trying to become more righteous by following rules or striving in yourself to be better, you are not living the Christian life as God intended it. You are not availing yourself of all that you have been given in Christ. And for years, that is how I lived the Christian life. Until I came to see my utter inability and sinfulness in myself through seeing God in his word. And then came to understand these truths in Romans 5 through 8. Now, it was for the first time, um, my understanding, not just of that I had sinned, but that I was utterly sinful, was in Bible school. Now, I could have said those words, but I didn't understand them before that. Like, I remember my pastor when I was a kid saying things like about we're just the scum of the earth and, and this kind of language and stuff, which actually we shouldn't be saying as Christians, as we'll see. But <clears throat> as far as who we were, you know, in Adam, yeah, that's true. Um, and so... <laughs> I could have said that, but my behavior was really good. Like, my outward behavior was great. I was the child that um, parents would say to, you know, my parents, like, How, what are you doing with Debbie? Like, she's so well behaved, and you should, like, teach us on parenting. I mean, I'm not joking. Now, that stuff's not good for, for a kid, okay? <laughs> because... <laughs> I did think that I was doing great. And now it wasn't necessarily that I thought it was because I, I was so good. I did think that it was because of God's work in me. But I just thought I'm trying really hard to be good and God's just making it happen. I didn't understand sanctification at all. Um, and I didn't see what was in my heart. Hey, I did not see it. Now, I've told you guys that looking back, I can remember thoughts that I had that were sinful. At the moment, I was doing something outwardly good. But at the time, I wasn't viewing that as sin. I wasn't viewing it for what it was. Well, when I was in Bible school, during my first semester, I started just realizing how incurably sinful I was and that I couldn't do anything. I couldn't do one thing without sin in my heart. I could not do the simple, I couldn't like get up and sing, you know, for worship team without sin in my heart. I couldn't, um, I couldn't answer a question in class without sin in my heart. I, I always found myself doing what I didn't want to do. I was having the Romans 7 experience where I was trying to do good. I was trying to be righteous, but it evaded me. And I couldn't. I could not get rid of pride in my heart. I could not get rid of the selfishness in my heart. It was there always, and I finally saw it for what it was. I've been praying for all of you 
the whole time we've been taking Romans, that God would help you to see your flesh for what it is so that you would be desperate to grasp on to God's provision for you in Christ. I had finally gotten to that point of seeing I can't do anything. And then I was in the perfect place to hear the truths that I learned in the New Testament, okay? And not just about the gospel. Yes, absolutely, the gospel for justification justification became more precious to me then than it had ever been before because I understood how sinful I was and how he paid for every sin. And it was way more sin than I thought and that I was sinful, that I was a sinner. I knew I was a sinner before, but it was more like I commit sinful acts. I didn't understand that at my core, I was a sinner. Now, someone who has been constituted a sinner, hardwired a sinner, set up to function as a sinner, cannot attain to righteousness. And so all that I was doing was taking the old man in Adam and trying to fix it. I was trying to make it better, but it's incurably evil. Paul says in Romans chapter seven, in me that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. We cannot, through our willpower or striving against sin, attain to true righteousness. We can attain to whitewashed, self-righteous, outward conformity, okay? but we cannot attain to true godliness and righteousness in our flesh, in ourselves, in our old man. All our willpower is not enough to overcome the old man. God had to do something else to save us from the bondage to sin which we received in Adam which was ours by our birthright in him. The will is there, okay? To will to do, he says, is present with me, but the power I don't find. It's not found within you, and you can't look for it and find it. You can't look for it by experience or feelings. You can only know God's way of deliverance for you, just like in your justification. You can only know God's way of deliverance for you through his written word, that he has revealed it. Where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. The law brings sin out, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> but God's grace towers over it in its abundant supply. What God has done in Christ, far more than just patches up the problem in Adam, it superabounds. It's got that hyper prefix on it. It's like a super, yeah. it super <laughs> abounds above and beyond the devastation that sin brought. So <laughs> my Bible school teacher used a kind of funny illustration, but I, I think of it sometimes, so I think it's effective. Now, he was talking about the Grand Canyon. Now, most people think of the Grand Canyon as a really beautiful place and a really beautiful thing, but humor me for a moment. Okay, so he said you could look at the Grand Canyon and, and think of it as like this horrible hole in the ground, right? It's like, it's huge, like it's a terrible hole in the ground. So if you think of it as this devastating huge hole in the ground, okay, um, 
And if that is like what was brought in through Adam, okay, what God's grace didn't do is just fill in the hole, okay? God's grace didn't just fill in the hole. God's grace put Mount Everest on top of the hole, okay? And, and then it put uh, the Eiffel Tower on top of it and the Sears Tower. And um, you know what I mean. I know what I'm saying. Anyways. He had a whole lot of other things, and I think he even had a graphic for it. I mean, it was great, but I'm not, I'm not that techie. It's funny that he would be more techie than me, but <laughs> I'm not that techie. So, but you get the idea. It's super bounding, way above and beyond the devastation that was brought in by Adam. So even though we might see the things that happened to us in Adam and be like, well, that stinks, like, that's not fair. I wasn't in the garden. Oh, but you were. And I, um, I didn't personally do this to become a sinner, to be in the state that I am in. Okay. But the truth is that because God collectively saw us all in Adam, okay, now one man, the Lord Jesus Christ, can be the new head of that race of incurables okay and all of those who are in adam okay can be in christ if they believe the gospel okay so um they get now not just the end of their life in adam but they get new life in christ in christ and we talked about last week that the life that we receive in Christ is eternal life, and that eternal life is not just heaven. Eternal life is receiving the life of Christ himself. It is not just a quantity of life, but it is a quality of life, abundant life that we receive. What we receive in Christ, it's so much greater than the magnitude of what we lost in Adam. It's far better this way. Because now, we are a new race with the head being Christ himself. God in human flesh. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. God's grace can reign because it is the source of righteousness and eternal life. The reign of grace is made possible by means of the righteousness that is granted to faith and is a reign realized through the experience of eternal life. Sin reigned over us in death in what we received in Adam, so that now grace might reign. And this is another way of stating what he said before, that those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. When the believer reigns in life, it is grace that is reigning. When the believer reigns in life, it is grace that is reigning because the believer has not done any work to receive what he or she has in Christ. The believer does not do any work or exert any effort to exhibit what he or she has in Christ. Now, when it says um, that grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life, the right, 
righteousness that we're talking about here. Okay, this brings us back to the theme text of the book of Romans. In it, in the message of the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. From faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. The justified person, the person who is righteous by faith, will live, will experience true life by faith. So it's the righteousness of God that is being given to us in Christ or through Christ Jesus our Lord. And <clears throat> that righteousness is experienced as eternal life. Or eternal life expresses the manner in which the reign of grace triumphantly manifests itself. That's from St. Hodge's commentary. So that preposition there, too, can be used a lot of different ways, <clears throat> but it can it could be used or paraphrased in this way, that the reign of grace is made possible by means of the righteousness that is granted to faith and is a reign realized through the experience of eternal life or right into the experience of eternal life. Now, Romans 6. <laughs> what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. Okay, so now he introduces a question, okay, that the natural man tends to have when the natural man hears about this crazy grace, right? Because if God was bringing in the law so that there would be more sin, so that his grace would abound above and beyond all of that sin, then people are like, that doesn't make sense. <clears throat> um, how can you teach such a thing? Because that will just encourage people to sin more, right? How can you teach that God brought in the law for the offense to abound so that he could exhibit his marvelous grace over it all. How can you teach that? Because that's just going to encourage people to sin. So should we just, you know, continue sinning more so that grace can just continue to abound above and beyond all of our sin that we're doing now? Now he gives that very strong rebuke to that. Certainly not. And this is the part of the only part of Romans 6 that I remember ever learning about or memorizing or being taught. Is just, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. I don't even remember learning the rest of the verse. I didn't understand the rest of the verse. <laughs> okay. Um, I just <laughs> knew that, oh, now we should stop sinning. Okay. Like, the gospel says that no matter how much you sin, right, your sins, past, present, and future, were all laid on Christ at the cross, that if you believe that uh, his sacrifice was enough to pay for all your sin, okay, and so that's incredible grace. And so, obviously, some people will think, well, then I can just keep, keep on sinning, keep sinning. And... Jesus already died for that, and so it'll just magnify the grace of God, okay? And no, okay, so that's as far as I got, was no, we shouldn't continue sinning. Okay, so then I was like, all right, so now I gotta be good, right? <laughs> time, it's time to get to work, right? Time to be good, and I, I'm telling you that almost, 
almost every time that I share the gospel with someone, like as a teenager, or would talk to someone after the gospel had been presented or whatever, like I would always end with this verse, okay? Um, and not even the whole verse, just like half of it, right? That, that now that you have been justified, you need to stop sinning, okay? Um, but I would never give them the how, how they could stop sinning, okay? Because I didn't know about it. <laughs> so um, we have to understand that this keeps going, okay? And absolutely, we are to stop sinning, okay? But um, we can't do it just by exerting our willpower and effort over sin. It's not going to happen, okay? So we need to know the rest of it. <laughs> we can't just know that we need to stop. We need to know how, right? So he says, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know? <coughs> hey, he expected this to be common knowledge. He expected that believers would be taught this early okay early on in their christian life that believers would be taught this we died to sin now <clears throat> died here is in the <clears throat> aorist tense okay you don't have to write that down but what you do need to know is that this is something that happened in the past and is over and complete and done with okay this is a final thing that happened in the past that's not my phone because i put mine on do not disturb <laughs> okay we died to sin okay how did we die to sin when did we die to sin now we're going to find out or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death. Okay, now, here a lot of times what happens, okay, when people are just taking a cursory reading of this, or, you know, when commentators are, are looking at this, is they immediately assume that this is talking about water baptism for some reason. Okay, because, again, we just... We just have a tendency to see words and just think um, of the one theological meaning that's most important to us, okay? And, and that's what tends to happen, is that people look at this and they think that this is talking about water baptism, so then they try to, like, figure out the rest of it around that. However, there is no reason to think that this is talking about water baptism. Um, now, understand that baptism is not a translation it's a transliteration of the greek word baptizo okay so when we see that word understand that the original greek word means immersion okay immersion it can have other um implications too okay but the main meaning of this word is to immerse and um baptism Okay, had a cultural significance. Now, I think we've, we've talked about this certainly in hermeneutics. I don't know if we've talked about it in Romans. But baptism had a cultural significance um, before it was practiced by John the Baptist. Um, so baptism, water baptism, would be performed when a Gentile became a Jew. Um, by this time, they were, they were doing baptisms, not only circumcisions, but also baptisms and it's a way of identifying with um, their new religion, okay? So when they were baptized, okay, into the Jewish faith, they were saying, I am I'm changing my identity. I'm no longer a Gentile, now I'm a proselyte or a, a Jewish Gentile. Okay, so that was already the, the cultural significance. So when John the Baptist is going around and telling everyone to be baptized um, because of repentance of sins, again, that is not the same baptiz water baptism even as Christians. Um, in the book of Acts, it talks about how there were some people who only knew the baptism of John. 
Okay, the baptism of John was for repentance, okay, for Israelites to separate themselves from their perverse generation, okay, and to identify with the teachings of John the Baptist. So when um, people were baptized in the name of Jesus, that is the way that water baptism is used. It's talked about as being in the name of Jesus. They are identifying with Jesus. So when people are baptized on the day of Pentecost, for instance, they are identifying with the message of the apostles concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. And they are making, yes, a public confession of faith through their water baptism. They're saying, I am no longer a part of this perverse generation that is against Christ. Now I am a Christian. I am identifying with Christ and with this message. And obviously baptism, water baptism, has symbolism in it as well of into um, the grave with Christ and being raised to new life. It is a symbol of that. But there is no mystical spiritual transformation that occurs in water baptism. There is not. What transpires when a person believes the gospel, though, is that they are baptized by the Holy Spirit. Okay, they are baptized by the Holy Spirit. Now, even when John the Baptist was going around and doing water baptisms for repentance, he said, I'm baptizing you with water, but there's one coming whose sandals I'm not even worthy to untie, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Okay, and then um, let's look at Galatians chapter 3. <clears throat> Uh, verses 26 through 28. This is parallel here. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ, see it's that same phrase, baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Okay, so this is talking about being baptized into Christ too. And it's saying if we're baptized into Christ, we're all one with one another, which lines up with baptism of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians. So 1 Corinthians, where did I write these down? <coughs> First Corinthians 12, verse 13. Okay, for by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Okay, so the Holy Spirit is the one who's doing this. Okay, the Holy Spirit <coughs> baptizes us when we believe into one body. So what body is he talking about? Christ, okay? So also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. Okay, now Jesus prays of, to the Father about this happening in John chapter 17. You can look back there sometime. Um, but he prays that we all may be one, as he and the Father are one. And he's not just talking about one with one another, but one with him also. I in them, and you and me, that they also may be one. 
our union with Christ is what makes us united to one another. Okay, when we're baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ, we're all in Christ, we're all incorporated into Christ, we're all in his body. And so it also affects our union with one another in the body of Christ. But that's not what he's talking about in Romans 6. So he doesn't mention that. Um, in Ephesians, that's a book about the church. So there he, he's talking about the church. Um, in 1 Corinthians, he's talking about their function together in the body of Christ. And so he talks about that aspect of spiritual baptism. But here we're talking about our union with Christ or our immersion into Christ. It is affected by the Holy Spirit the moment we believe. And again, he expected that they would have already known this. Okay, so this wouldn't have been confusing to them like it can be to us when we read the word baptism and we're like, He's talking about water baptism because we always make assumptions like that. Okay, they wouldn't have been confused on this because they would have already been taught that when they believed, okay, they were baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ. And being baptized into Christ all together means we're all one. Okay, we're all one in Christ Jesus. But that's not what we're talking about right now. Right now we're talking about our union with Christ. Okay? So, I have my gracious volunteer, Christina. Just pretend this is just Christina. Okay, now I have Christina here. Okay, and let's let's say this envelope is Christ. Okay? I'm not making a, an image. Where is this is an example. So, let's pretend. There's no picture of him. Okay, this is Christ. So, if I immerse, okay, Christina into Christ, if I place her into Christ, if I put her in union with Christ, okay, and it's final, it happened in the past, okay. Now, if I put this envelope, envelope in my <laughs> notebook, where is Christina? I'm not talking about her. I'm talking about her. <laughs> where is Christina now? In Christ. Same in Christ, life. where? In the notebook, right? Okay, yeah, very good. Okay, now what if I put Christ, the envelope, on the ground? Where is Christina? In Christ. She's in Christ and she's on the ground, okay? Now, what if I throw it up into the air, okay? Where is Christina? When it's up in the air, she's up in the air, right? If, if I mail this envelope to Taiwan, okay? <laughs> and it is sitting in, an, in a mailbox. I don't know how, the, how their mailboxes work, but it's sitting in a mailbox in Taiwan. Where is Christina? In Christ. In Christ, in, in Taiwan, okay? In the mailbox. She's in the mailbox. She's in Christ, okay? And it doesn't change, okay? It doesn't change based on what her face looks like, okay? Or anything that she's doing in there. She is in Christ, <laughs> okay? And so wherever Christ is, that's where she is. And, and whatever, you know, Christ goes through, that's what she's going through. And uh, whatever... Christ receives, that's what she receives. Christ receives a stamp, she's got the stamp too. Okay? <laughs> so, I'll take this out. But we won't ever be taken out of Christ. Okay? We've been baptized into Christ. We've been immersed in Him. We've been united with Him. Okay? Fully immersed into Christ. Incorporated into Him. Okay? We are united with Him. And every time you see the phrase in Christ, it's talking about what you have based on that union with him. Okay, what you have in Christ Jesus. Now understand this, that God views you in Christ. In um, 1 Corinthians 1.30, It 
says this, but of God you are in Christ Jesus. Of God you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Christ is our sanctification. Christ is our righteousness. Okay, but that's not the point of the verse right here that I'm trying to get to. Of God, you are in Christ Jesus. This is God's work, okay? That God, through the Holy Spirit, has placed you into Christ, has baptized you into him. And that is how God sees you. And so wherever Christ is, that is where you are. You might say, well, isn't Christ seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven? Yes. Okay, and that's why Ephesians says that we have been raised and that we are seated in the heavenly places in Christ. <clears throat> You're there. You're there. But do you live like it? Okay, now... Now, we're going to talk more about how we can actually experience what we have in Christ. But these are, these are something called positional truths. Okay, positional truth is a term that means this. Things God says are true of me because of my identification or union with Christ. They are true, not make-believe, not positive thinking. We must learn to gauge truth, not by our senses, our feelings, but by God's word. The truest thing about you is what God says about you. You are in Christ. And so guess what? Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Because of our union with Christ, because God sees us in him. When Christ died, you died too. Okay? When Christ died on the cross, you died in him. Now, you didn't do anything to make it happen. Okay, it's that that's where he was. And because you're in Christ and because like God identifies you with Christ, you died with Christ. You were baptized into Christ Jesus. You were united with him. And so you were also united with him in his death. You receive the benefits of what he did as if you did it yourself. And you were there. <laughs> you died with Christ when he died on the cross. You are not trying to die to yourself. Okay? You are not trying to die to sin. You're not working towards it by some kind of effort of yours. You died. As surely as Christ died in the past, finally and forever, and will never die again, okay, you died with him then. So you're dead. Okay, so why don't you repeat with me? I'm dead. I'm dead. I'm dead. Good. I'm going to say it a little bit louder. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm dead. dead. Okay, so everyone knows you're dead, okay? You're, you're not <clears throat> trying to die, okay? You're not asking God to help you die. You're dead. Okay, so what does this mean? We were baptized into to his death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. So it's like this burial it's like we're completely hidden from view right now you can't see christine anymore 
She's completely in the envelope, okay? Through our, our baptism, okay, we are completely immersed into Christ, into his death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So Christ died and was raised from the dead by God the Father, by his power, so that we also should walk in the newness of life. In context, what is this talking about? What's the newness of life? I know some of you weren't here for Romans 5. <laughs> it's the resurrection life of Christ. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Before Jesus died and was raised, there was no resurrection life. Okay? Now, people had been raised from the dead, but they were raised back to the same experience, right? The same thing. They were raised back to the same body, held captive by sin. They were raised back to the same bondage. They were raised back to the same Adam cookie dough. Okay? They were raised back to that. So when like Lazarus was raised from the dead, that's nothing like when Christ was raised from the dead. Lazarus wasn't experiencing resurrection life. He was going to die again. Right? When when these People, uh, like Jairus' daughter, okay, was raised to life. She's raised to this same life experience, still held captive by her sinful body, um, and going to die, okay, going to die again. But what about Jesus? Okay, he became sin, okay? He who knew no sin became sin for us, and he died. And then he resurrected. Was he resurrected back to the same old body that he had before? Was he resurrected, but he still had sin on him? No. Okay. He resurrected completely victorious over sin and death, never to die again. And with sin all completely done away with, okay? So sin had no more personal claim on him, and death did not have any claim on him, and never will. Again, now I keep saying resurrection life of Christ, and you might think, think why is it resurrection life of Christ? Why isn't it just like the life of Christ? Because, you know, he was always perfectly righteous before. Okay, but he became a person. Okay, he became a person. And he bore our sin upon himself. And he became sin itself. So that we might become his righteousness. Okay, he bore sin on himself, on the cross. And because our sin was upon him, he not only died physically, but he experienced that spiritual death. What is that verse? That he became sin? Uh, first, is it Second Corinthians? I think it's Second Corinthians. <clears throat> I, I think I wrote down the reference. <laughs> you have to Google it afterwards. <laughs> you Sorry, it was bothering me. That's I'm like, okay. what is it? Okay, I should know the reference. I'm very bad with references. I'm okay. Sorry. Um, that's okay. Here, she knows. Second Corinthians 5 21. That's not great. Okay. <laughs> I thought it was Second Corinthians. <laughs> 
<laughs> got it that is. part anyways. Second, yeah, then put on the side, the 21. <laughs> He became sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Okay, so when he was on the cross, it was all taken care of, okay? When he was on the cross, he died spiritually, okay? Because our sin was placed upon him, the Father poured out his wrath upon him and turned away from his son. And for the first time in all of eternity, the relationship between God the Father and the son was broken. He took the spiritual separation from God that was ours in Adam, that we deserved, okay, that we lived in. He took that spiritual separation from God because he became sin okay, so that we could become his righteousness because when he died on behalf of humanity he wasn't just taking the penalty okay, but he took us there with him and we die. Our old man was crucified with him. All that we were in Adam, our old man <clears throat> was put to death in the cross of Christ. Remember again that death does not mean eradication. It never means that in scripture. Okay, your old man has not been eradicated, does not cease to exist, okay, but it was crucified when Jesus died. It says, for if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, and we have, Certainly, we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Okay. A lot of times we see the word resurrection and we think about our eternal future in heaven or our glorification the resurrection of our physical bodies. And Paul talks about how what Christ did in our identification with him will result in us one day having glorified bodies like his glorified body in 1 Corinthians 15, totally free from sin. Okay, but we can have the experience now okay we can have the experience of resurrection life now okay that life that christ <clears throat> had and has okay since his resurrection from the dead as a person okay he died as a person he died to sin entirely and in Hebrews, it says he came to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself once for all. Once for all. He's never going to have to die for sin again. Sin is, is never um, going to be on him again. He's never going to bear the weight of it again. He <laughs> took all sin upon himself when he died on the cross, and he did it once for all. So he dies no more. Death has no more dominion over him. He's never going to be separated spiritually 
from God the Father ever, ever, ever again. He is raised to newness of life, to resurrection life. And he was raised as a man, okay? As a human, he didn't just go back to what he was before the incarnation. I don't know if you've ever thought about that before, okay? But Jesus didn't like die and then raise up and then just go back to being, you know, his spiritual being that he was before. No, he became a man and he, he didn't just become a man so that he could die for sin. He also became a man so that he could have resurrection life as a person and make it available to every one of us. Okay, and also there's other things that go along with him becoming a man, like he has the rights to rule this world, okay? So the Lordship of Christ also over this world, conquering sin and death and Satan for all time on the cross. All of that was affected in his death. Jesus is not striving to gain victory over sin and death. He's not still working on it. Okay, he has it. He got it. He won it at the cross. And his victory belongs to all of those in Christ. He was victorious over sin and death. You have his victory. It's not something that you need to strive to achieve or attain to. Okay, he died to sin. You died to sin. He died to sin once for all. You died to sin once for all. Sin has no power over him. Sin has no power over you. Death has no more dominion over him. Death has no dominion over you. Now I said before that there is only one way out of Adam's race, okay? Only one way out of our identification with him. That one way is death. We were born into Adam we were born identified with him, and so we were born with all the consequences that his sin brought. But we died. We died out of that race. We died out of that realm. We died with Christ, and we were raised with him to resurrection life. Right? Mm -hmm. You're in Christ. Okay, so you died with him to your old life in Adam. <coughs> you died to sin. He died to sin. You died to sin. He was raised victorious. You were raised victorious. You were raised with his life. Before, all you had was that old Adam source, okay, that old Adamic cookie dough, that source of life, the sinner, the old man. That was the only source. You had maybe some choice about like which sins you were going to commit, right? But you had no choice but to sin. You're in complete bondage and utter slavery to sin in Adam. So what God didn't do was fix up who you were. He said you need to be born again. Okay, why did Jesus say you need to be born again? Because the old man is unfixable. Okay, and so the old man was put to death. And you were born again in Christ Jesus. You were made a new creation in Christ. You were raised to a new realm of life. You died out of that old realm in Adam, and you were raised to new life in Christ. Christ died to sin. This is a final, definitive, historical act. His relationship to sin 
that he had in that brief time on the cross when death had dominion over him is over forever. And the relationship that you had to sin with sin as your master is over. It's broken through the death of the slave. John 8, 34 says this. Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. We were slaves of sin in Adam, but the Son has set us free. We are free indeed. And the way that he did it was by <clears throat> our identification with him in his death. The labor is not in you striving to exercise your willpower over sin. The labor is in knowing and trusting the provision God has made for you in Christ and walking in it. Not by me exerting my efforts, but by me simply Resting in, by faith, what God has already done. What God says is true. His objective is that we should walk in newness of life. The true eternal life of Jesus Christ himself, sharing in his resurrection. As we've been talking about that Paul makes his aim of life. In Philippians chapter 3 to share in the resurrection life of Christ we struggle to believe that our death with Christ was effective so we go on living as though nothing ever happened and we turn to praying and asking for help, avoiding faith. <coughs> One of Satan's great tactics is to turn believers to begging and beseeching God to do something he has already done. Asking God to give us victory when he has already given it. Asking God to help us to exercise patience when we have the resurrection life of Christ. Does Christ struggle to be patient? No! <laughs> no way! Okay, but this is, this is what you have been given is the newness of life in Christ. You've been united to him. And the resurrection life that he gained when he raised from the dead is the eternal life that you have been given. It's the life that's in the Son. You have it. You have him. You have the resurrection life of Jesus that is completely and totally and finally victorious over sin and death. that is perfectly patient, inherently righteous, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. You have been given in Christ Jesus. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. 
Whoever remains in me bears much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. Your old self is not capable of producing true spiritual fruit. But you've been given the life that's in the vine. Right? If a branch decides to separate from the vine and try to produce fruit on its own, it's not going to happen. Okay? Because the life is in the vine. The life is in the vine. Jesus is the life. He is that eternal life that was with the Father. He is abundant resurrection life. We abide in him by taking what God has given us in Christ by faith. Depending on him to do what he has said. Depending on him that he has done what he has said he has done. And he has said that anyone who has died is free from sin. Our old man was crucified with him that the body of sin might be nullified that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Now the body of sin, okay, that's talking about my body, my unredeemed body as sin's instrument. Right? Because it's through our bodies that we carried out this slavery to sin. Okay, through our members, it's going to talk about members next week. Our hands, our feet, our mind. Okay, all of the things that are in us were at the service of sin. Okay, and now he says that our old man, or who we were in Adam, was crucified with Christ so that our bodies might be put out of business for slavery to sin. Okay, that word there, nullified, okay, that word nullified, that the body of sin might be nullified, it means put out of business, okay, put out of business, okay, or rendered inoperative. So it's put out of business for producing sin. Doesn't mean we can't walk in sin. Doesn't mean we can't produce sin. Okay, but it is no longer under the mastery and slavery to sin because of our death with Christ. Here's the thing about your death with Christ, okay? You will feel, okay, all the time, the pulls of your sinful body, okay? And so you'll have feelings like, your children right they're they're whining and fighting and the the noise volume is going up exceedingly okay and um you didn't get much sleep last night right? and you will feel okay you will feel sin in your body okay and you will feel that you cannot right that that's how you will feel okay you will feel, I cannot walk in patience, okay? You will feel, I cannot walk in righteousness. I cannot avoid reacting, okay, in sin. You will feel those things. And God says, you need to know that that old man is dead and that you died to sin and it has no claim over you as much as sin has no claim over Christ sin has no claim over you it has no power to control you okay Romans 6 through 8 is our emancipation proclamation the truth is you've been set free from that slavery that old slave master doesn't have the right to tell you what to do and doesn't have the power to control you. So you will feel, 
I have to sin. Is that true? No, it's not true. You don't have to sin. It has no power over you. It has no power to control you because you died with Christ. The slave died. Okay, so the slave master doesn't have any control anymore. You died. Okay, you died. If you were employed, okay, by a terrible employer, and you die. <laughs> Does the employer still have control of you? Does it still have like rights to you? Does the employer get to tell you what to do? No, okay? It's the same with us dying to sin, okay? We died, okay, and it's final. And sin doesn't have the right to tell us what to do. It doesn't have the right to control us any more than it has the right to control Christ. We died out of that realm so that we would no longer be slaves of sin. Anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Not only were you freed from sin, but you were given the resurrection life of Christ, which we'll get to more in chapter 8. <clears throat> the death that Christ died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. No, no longer is Jesus concerned with sin, right? Everything now is oriented towards God. The life that he lives, he lives to God. <clears throat> He's not concerned with sin. He's living to God. So in verse 11, it says this. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The first thing that we need is we need to know. Right? He says, knowing this, knowing this, do you not know? Do you not know? Okay, the only way, we're not going to know this again by our senses or by our feelings or anything like that. We're only going to know it because God's word says it. Okay, so first we need to know, and now we're given a command. He says, likewise, you also, just like Christ, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay, reckon. You guys recognize that word? <laughs> Okay, that's from Romans 4, and it's the word legitimai, and it's the word that Paul uses over and over to talk about God reckoning a sinner righteous, okay? Or him counting, it's an accounting term. Remember we talked about that? That God accounts the ungodly sinner as righteous. Okay, now God is saying we need to reckon or account ourselves. To be dead and deed unto sin. Now this is a faith word. Okay? But he doesn't use the word faith. He instead uses the word reckon. Okay? We are to know it and then we are to reckon it to be true. Okay, this is what reckoning is like. Oh no, I don't have the marker. <laughs> I have the wet erase one, so we're gonna have to. Okay, maybe some of you still keep a checkbook. I don't know. Say you keep a checkbook. <laughs> okay, and you're you're keeping track of how much money you have at your disposal, right? How much money you have to use. Okay, so you have to this is a terrible marker. You <laughs> you have to keep track accurately, right? Um and so it doesn't, reckoning doesn't work like this. You don't say, well, I count it to be true. Like, you know that in your bank account, you have $200. But you're like, well, I reckon, right? <laughs> it to be 2000 <laughs> Okay, let's see. That I just spent $100. So now I have... Oh, now I have a thousand dollars. Okay, now that's bad accounting. Okay, that's bad accounting. Now you need to understand this. Reckoning is not making pretend. Okay, like it's not making believe or playing pretend, and something comes into reality because you think it to be. No, that's not reckoning. God doesn't tell you like just think you're dead to sin. Okay, no. Okay, that's bad accounting, and that's not faith. Okay, that's 
That's presumption, right? If we say, oh, I have a thousand dollars. I have a thousand dollars, I have a thousand dollars, right? And then we just expect it to come to be, to come to fruition, that's called presumption, right? Now, people talk about faith that way sometimes, okay? Like, when I was going through infertility, like, oh, just have faith that the Lord is going to bless you with a child. Now, that's not biblical faith. That's presumption. Because God didn't promise in his word that I was going to have a child, okay? So for me to say, oh, I just, I have faith that God is going to give me a child. That's not biblical faith. Okay, that's not reckoning on the facts of God's word. We talk about walking by faith. We are not talking about that. We are talking about God says that this is true. So it is absolutely true. So I better count it to be true. Right? So instead of this, okay, oh yeah, the wet erase. <laughs> okay, God says I'm dead to sin. Okay, now it doesn't matter what I do over here, right? Doesn't matter my performance or anything else. Doesn't matter my feelings, doesn't matter anything. What I have in here is dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. I'm not separated from the life of God anymore. I'm not under the control or mastery of sin. I'm not under bondage to sin. I am. Okay, so reckon or account it to be true. <coughs> Believe God that this is available to you. Right? When we say reckon, when we're talking about accounting, we're talking about something that's available to us to use in real life, right? Like if I have a thousand dollars and then I account in my checkbook, I have a thousand dollars. Then I have it in my mind that I have a thousand dollars to use. Okay, I have a thousand dollars to spend. In reality, in real life, he says account it, reckon, account it to be true that you are dead indeed unto sin and alive unto God in Christ Jesus. So when you are feeling, I can't. When those thoughts are in your mind, you're like, I can't, I can't. Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin and alive unto God. Not because it's not true and you're trying to make it true, because it is true. You died. Remember today that you said, I'm dead. And you died. And you didn't die today. <laughs> you died when Christ died. Okay, you are dead to sin. It has no power over you. No power to control you. You have the eternal, abundant life of Jesus Christ. You have his righteousness, his patience, his love, his kindness. All he has in his resurrection life, you have now. What is true of him is true of you because you are in Christ. And you don't have to do anything to get it. It's yours. Because God has placed you in Christ. God has united you with Christ. God has identified you with Christ. God has given you the life of Christ. God has united you in Christ's death. All that you have you have because of your union with Christ, because of your identification with him. And now what we need is a whole new mindset. That's why Romans chapter 12 says that we're changed by the renewing of our minds. What the Christian life is not, okay, is you read... Romans 6 one time, okay, or you read Romans 5 through 8 one time, and then you're like, yeah, I believe, I believe that's true, and then you just like, you're like, okay, I depend on you to make this true in my life, and then you just sit back and do nothing, 
Okay, now we're gonna talk about that next week. Okay, but that's not walking by faith. Be like, yeah, I believe that, and then you just wait for it to happen by osmosis. Okay, that's not how the Christian life works. Okay, we'll talk about it next week. More, and then even more in Romans <coughs> chapter 8. What God has given you is at your disposal, so you can use it. Okay, so you can use it. He became sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, Romans 6 isn't the only place he ta talks about our death with Christ. In Colossians, he says, you died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. Okay? There's more than one place where he talks about this. And I think it's, it's helpful, especially when you're first learning about all of it, okay, to know this isn't the only place it's talked about. It's just this is the only place it's all laid out. Because, again, this was the first stuff he would have taught after the gospel. So all of the other churches were already understanding this. And so when he writes to them concerning it, he just writes a little blip about it. You know, like in Colossians where he's like, since you've been raised with Christ, seek those things that are above where Christ is. Right? When Christ, who is our life appears we also shall appear with him in glory talks about how we've died talks about how those who have been baptized into christ have put on christ so you will start seeing it all over the place okay now that you know what god means when he says you're in christ and that you died. But I want to challenge you guys this week to take some time to just read and meditate on and pray concerning these truths. I said last time, I think it was, that God says not to lean on our own understanding. We will not come to these truths through our reasoning or our understanding. We will come to these truths through the revelation that God has given us in his word and through the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit. So depend on him to help you to understand these truths okay, so that you can walk by faith in them in your everyday life. God didn't set you free from sin so that you would continue to live defeated. He gave you the victorious, abundant life of Jesus Christ so that you would walk in newness of life. And we do grow in our knowledge of him and in our constancy of dependence on him and on these truths. But we have to know the truths. So meditate on them this week. I'm going to read to you guys a little bit um, out of this book, an illustration that he used uh, to help a friend <laughs> understand. He says, I remember one day in Shanghai, I was talking with a brother who was very... <coughs> exercised, very concerned about his spiritual state. He said, so many are living beautiful, saintly lives. I am ashamed of myself. I call myself a Christian, and yet when I compare myself with <coughs> others, I feel I am not one at all. I want to know this crucified life, this resurrection life, but I do not know it, and I see no way of getting there. Another brother was with us, and the two of us have been talking for two hours or so trying to get the man to see that he could not have anything apart from Christ, but without success. Said our friend, the best thing a man can do is pray. We said, but if God has already given you everything, what do you need to pray for? Now, here he's saying, as far as asking God for victory and help and stuff, he's not saying don't pray, <laughs> okay? He hasn't, the man replied, for I am still losing my temper, still failing constantly, so I must pray more. 
Well, we said, do you get what you pray for? I am sorry to say that I do not get anything, he replied. We tried to point out that just as he had done nothing for his justification, so he need do nothing for his sanctification. Just then, a third brother, much use of the Lord, came in and joined us. There was a thermos flask on the table. And this brother picked it up and said, what is this? A thermos flask. Well, you just imagine for a moment that this thermos flask can pray. And it starts praying something like this. Lord, I want very much to be a thermos flask. Will you make me to be a thermos flask? Lord, give me grace to become a thermos flask. Do please make me one. What will you say? I do not think even a thermos flask would be so silly, our friend replied. It would be nonsense to pray like that. It is a thermos <laughs> flask. Then my brother said, you are doing the same thing. God in times past has already included you in Christ. When he died, you died. When he lived, you lived. Now today you cannot say, I want to die. I want to be crucified. I want to have resur resurrection life. The Lord simply looks at you and says, you are dead. You have new life. All your praying is just as absurd as that of a thermos flask. You do not need to pray to the Lord for anything. You merely need your eyes open to see that he has done it all. That is the point. We need not work to die. We need not wait to die. We are dead. We only need to recognize what the Lord has already done and to praise him for it. Light dawned for that man with tears in his eyes. He said, Lord, I praise thee that thou hast already included me in Christ. All that is his is mine. Revelation had come and faith had something to lay hold of. And if you could have met that brother later on, what a change you would have found. One more, okay? I'm not going to read you this whole book, but I'm going to read you one more illustration here. Suppose for the sake of illustration that the government of your country should wish to deal drastically with the question of strong drink and should decide that the whole country was going to go dry. How could the decision be carried into effect? How could we help if we were to search every shop and house throughout the land and smash all the bottles of wine or beer or brandy we came across, would that meet the case? Surely not. We might thereby rid the land of every drop of alcoholic liquor it contains, but behind those bottles of strong drink are the factories that produce them. And if we only deal with the bottles and leave the factories untouched, production will still continue and there is no permanent solution of the problem. No, the drink producing factories, the breweries and distilleries throughout the land must be closed down if the drink question is ever to be effectively and permanently settled. We are the factories. Our actions are the products. The blood of the Lord Jesus dealt with the question of the products, namely our sins. So the question of what we have done is settled. But would God have stopped there? What about... The question of what we are. Our sins were produced by us. They have been dealt with, but how are we going to be dealt with? Do you believe the Lord would cleanse away all our sins and then leave us to get rid of the sin-producing factory? Do you believe that having put away the goods produced, he would leave us to deal by ourselves with the source of production? To ask this question is but to answer it. Of course, he has not done half the work and left the other half undone. He has done away with the goods and also made a clean sweep of the factory that produces the goods. The finished work of Christ has gone to the root of our problem and dealt with it. There are no half measures with God. He has made full provision for sin's rule to be utterly broken. Knowing this, says Paul, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be put out of business so that we should no longer be in bondage to sin. So much more that we could talk about. <laughs> Thank you.
I went a little bit over my hour and 30 minutes. <laughs>